help women save lives and peacefully end abortion where you live. I can tell you exactly uh, what would happen. Um, The infant would be delivered. Uh, The infant would be kept comfortable. Uh, The infant would be resuscitated if if that's what the uh, mother and the family desired. You were serious about that? Be inspired to change hearts and minds by joining over one million volunteers taking part in the global movement happening in your neighborhood. She says, pray that I can get through this abortion. And I said, oh, no, no. So she went ahead and went into the abortion clinic. And she just came out. She told me, I'm not going to get the abortion. We just had a baby saved. But we had a baby saved and never to die. Pray the Lord. This is the 40 Days for Life podcast with your host, Sean Carney. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the 40 Days for Life podcast. I'm Sean Carney, the president of 40 Days for Life and your host for this podcast, which is dedicated to helping you end abortion where you live. What to say when to. That is the topic of today's podcast, why we wrote a sequel to the first What to Say When, uh, why it's needed, some of the highlights that we cover Uh, in the book and some things that um, you need to know about the book, particularly that you can read What to Say When Part 2 without having read What to Say When, uh, the first one, uh, which covers a lot of the traditional abortion arguments. Um, But as we have seen, apparently things have changed since the overturning of Roe v. Wade and through many requests uh, for a sequel, Um, which we didn't see as necessary early on, became very much necessary. And Steve Carlin and I have written that book. You can pre-order it. Uh, It comes out on September uh, the 10th. And so today we will be talking about some of the topics in the book and um, and how we ended up here uh, writing another book, which we did not intend to do. So um, on this podcast is... uh, really the greatest co-author in the history of the universe, and that is Mr. Steve Carlin himself, who always knows what to say. I want to put that now on my business card, the greatest co-author in, in, what, in history, like throughout time. The history, the history of, of the, the universe. universe. I, I included uh, aliens and uh, other planets. I appreciate that, Sean. Yeah, I knew, I knew you would. And it's true. That I can tell. <laughs> And we have Heather. Where, where's your book? How come you haven't written a book yet? You have a lot to say. It's it's all in here. I have a, <laughs> I have a lot to say. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean it people ought, want to it read it. It ought to be said or written. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so uh, you are a good critic, honestly. And so um, I have been known to be very critical. You've been very critical, but it's constructive. <laughs> it's not like oh, there's another rant. Um, and so this will be this will be crucial of you know why this why the book is needed why it's necessary what it covers and um, and how it's helpful the whole point of this like the first one uh, which I did not want to write the first what to say when it didn't really motivate me everybody was like you need to write a book on apologetics for like ten years and I'm like I don't know there's so much stuff and I don't everybody knows what to say that was just my mainly living in a bubble of like the pro life movement. And I know for me, I don't know about for you, but uh, it was like 2020 or COVID hit, and abortion was on the news. And this pro-abortion person was saying something. And we had a lot of family over. My in-laws were there who were super pro-life, right? My father-in-law is an OBGYN. And I said, that's so stupid. They need to say, and I forget what it was. I actually don't remember the point. And my mother-in-law was like, that, that makes total sense. Nobody knows what to say. You should write a book. And <laughs> she just wants me to write a book or do whatever. Like, she's just like a fan. So yes. I, I kind of, and she's like, people really don't know. They don't know. You know, that's this exactly how she sounds. Voice. It's totally her voice, right? <laughs> she went, they went to Ireland for a friend's ordination of the priesthood. And like, people were in the pub, like, literally like paying her to talk. Oh my like gosh. Her, her accent cracks us up as Texans. So she's like, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. So um, she's going to, re- she listens to the podcast. So oh. I love you. Hi, Lisa. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but that was really, uh, we started going through some of the topics. And anyways, COVID hit. So we, we ended up writing some in 2020 and then uh, really got into it, released the book in September of 2021, um, not knowing, obviously, hoping and suspecting that it would be overturned a year later. But um, 
the book surprised me. I don't know if it surprised you of of the uh, the demand for it once once we released it. No, it was a huge blessing, and I think God's timing was providential because you'll remember, Sean, we had discussed this, and, and you're like, oh, just have this on your radar. Maybe in like two or three years, the time will be right. And then COVID shut everything down, and I, I called you, and I said, you, you want to just do this now? And you started laughing. You said, I was thinking maybe the same thing. So yeah. <laughs> we did it, and thanks be to God, it came out right as the Supreme Court was set to hear that case. And uh, obviously, there was a demand for it. I was delighted to see that it, it helped people. And we said all along from the beginning, I think people do know the truth about abortion, but they sometimes lack confidence in expressing it and articulating it. And so the first book, as well as the second book, I think are really designed to just give people the confidence that they don't have to feel like they're on their heels, like they're on defense, like they're the bad guys for wanting to save innocent children from being torn apart. Yeah, and I think one thing that happened definitely is abortion was just not in the news when we Mm. released the first one, and it's been in the news the arguments have changed. They've gotten weirder. And you it's hard to actually get to the heart of the matter when it comes to abortion. We have to deal with all these weird things and odd things. And the hypothetical scenarios aren't hypothetical anymore. Because just as they weren't talking about abortion in 2021, they're not talking about it now. They're right. talking about every other issue that they can try to rope into it. They're wearing their goofy <laughs> handmade costumes, and they're <laughs> they're talking about um, you know everything other than topic at hand. Even the dissent in, in the Dobbs decision didn't really address abortion, didn't really address Roe v. Wade. It was just uh, kind of this yelling and shouting, and so... We, uh, we've got an opportunity to, to turn the focus back on to what is abortion and why are we pro-life and why did the Supreme Court overturn Roe v. Wade? And when those questions are the ones that are being talked about, pro-lifers rack up some victories. And uh, we covered Dobbs a lot. And I think people are, well, we cover Dobbs. And do you have to be a constitutional lawyer to talk about it? Do you know, what do you say when they say the Supreme Court is a bunch of male bigots appointed by Trump and they hate women. And what did Alito say? Like the Supreme Court just doesn't overturn 50 year precedent because they, you know, had a bad day or they love Trump. And, and I think, you know, it's a healthy breakdown of Dobbs because what happened, which is shocking and actually disappointing and frustrating is that the overturning of Roe intimidated pro-lifers to defend. To defend it. It did. Yeah, it really did. I know that I had several... You said we're in our own bubble often, Sean, and that's true, because I had several friends who messaged me privately, you know, on on social media or texted me and like, okay, my so-and-so, you know, college classmate is saying this or my pro-abortion uncle is saying this. How would you defend this? And so there was oftentimes where I referenced what to say when and and encouraged them, don't take my word for it, read this, look at the citations. Um, but I had I ended up getting to a point where I just had stuff ready. I just had like copy and pasted stuff, show them this, because these are the common crap things that people are saying that are simply not true and easily debunked. Here's where you can say that. Be nice about it. I'm, you know, we can rant here in this private message and then be charitable, right? Like to whoever you're talking to. <laughs> this crap. That is that chapter one of the new book. I think no. Um, uh, crap, they say. <laughs> but it's it's very important, and one of the the feedback from the first one is, of course, the arguments. And if you want to be a self righteous know it all, you'll be able to do that. Yeah, you'll be able to smoke people. Sure. When, you, when they bring up abortion, light them up. Light them up, baby. You bring on, bring it on. Kick the tires and light the fires, Uncle Big Larry. Daddy. At Thanksgiving, <laughs> I want abortion to come up. I'm gonna kill you. Uh-huh. And so, you know that that's not a good motivation. But I think the approaches that we take, the questions to ask, particularly now, because with the overturning, the intensity of the other side is huge, and we we have to change. That's why the book is needed because th- th- we don't talk about abortion. They they talk about how you know evil we are, how we want to lock up women, how. Um, you know, the, the women are going to travel, um, that this is unjust, that we're slave owners. Definitely get into that and what to say when to. We're the slave owners. Um, we don't care about born children. We want 14-year-old rape victims to birth their rapist baby. All of these things. And it was just amazing after a huge victory like Roe falling that we're more scared 
of abortion coming up. But the problem is, and this is this is kind of what we base the structure of the book on, is that the other side is scared and they're botching it, pun intended, because Roe was awesome. It was like a great comfort. I believe in, a, I support the, the Supreme Court and a woman's constitutional right to abortion. Well, that's gone. Settled law. Alito blew that up with dynamite, okay, legally. Not like, I'm Catholic and I hate women, like they say. That's not what happened. He dissects the entire thing. And, um, and it was bad law and, and all of that. But when you don't have that to rely on, which is the best abortion argument, look, we're 50 years into this. What are you talking about? This is one of the most common surgeries. A lot of people have had abortions. Mm. But now you have to talk about why the Supreme Court did that and what abortion is. And um, they're not equipped to do it. And that's why, bless her heart, we had Whoopi Goldberg saying that we were going to be stepping over. She remembers the days where you were stepping over the dead women in the bathroom from their self-induced abortions. Where in the world was she going to the bathroom? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. I, I mean, <laughs> what it was bathroom? Not Bucky's. It wasn't Bucky's. <laughs> Bucky's, you would never have that. Cleanest. Cleanest bathrooms ever. And Bucky wouldn't tolerate that stuff. So, one of the challenges, too, of course, is they're not prepared to talk about it. But so many of the politicians who, at least until two years ago, declared themselves to be pro life, they don't know how to talk about it either. And right. they're embarrassed. And sometimes we look to our leaders for leadership and we're not always getting it and that's unfortunate and so we need to really lead from the grassroots in that sense it's so easy to kind of look and, and expect that meaningful change in america begins with the elites or with the president or with congress but so often they're dragged kicking and screaming often across the finish line by the culture that was the case with the civil rights movement and so we're a new civil rights movement right now and we're gonna drag the politicians across the finish line if we have to here because on either side of the aisle i don't think they've proven that they're ready yeah it's too much is what a lot of them were saying a lot of the pro-life politicians it's just, it's just too soon or it's too much right now i'm not really sure about roe versus wade being overturned like maybe we should have you know, I don't know. I don't know what their solution would would have been. I, I had pastors say that. Yeah. No kidding. I, mean, I had pro life. Yeah. I had a really good one. And I'm like, hey, let me talk to you because he's like, I think it was too much too soon. And I'm like, let's go over here on the corner and talk. <laughs> What's the matter with you? You know. So, <laughs> that's the first chapter. What's the matter with you? I hate when somebody launches a book though, and they don't like tell you what's in it. So we, we can be a little bit more direct here. Okay. So the differences of the first one and the second one. Number one, the second one. I would say uh, is kind of drenched in Tabasco sauce. A little Texas Pete. It's got some Texas Pete hot it, sauce. It's uh, to to reference our Thanksgiving podcast. It's the third Oppenheimer turkey where you had the <laughs> slap your mama and, uh, <laughs> and the and Texas Pete on it. And uh, we're not saying that like we're on rants and we're going to tell you the truth, boy. It's not that. It is the subject matter has gotten. I would say spicy. What, what to say when <laughs> one is PG. What to Say When 2 is for sure PG-13. I don't think it's R. Maybe bumps up against that because of some of the crazy stuff we have to cover. Um, but it's definitely PG-13. It's a little bit longer, um, and which just shows the, the, the depth that we had to cover. But the similarity is the format. Um, you will know what to say when. We cover it point by point on the many different topics. It's an easy book. It's accessible. One of the uh, feedbacks that the feedback that we got from the first one was, hey, I can just go and look up, look up something. I don't have to read it cover to cover. I can just go to a certain chapter. We had that in mind, obviously, with what to say when to. So you can go. Uh, you'll see each clear point with references. Steve Carlin is one of the best researchers that I know, and it's just fantastic. So you will be equipped and ready to go. Incredible. It's also got a lot more surprises. I think one of the things that separates this, um, among other things, is the emphasis on rape and incest. And multiple, not just the arguments, but the, which we cover rape, it's, it's one chapter in the first one, but the depth that we get into it and the specific examples, because we're tired of people telling us that we love rapists and we hate teenage pregnant rape victims. It's total BS. And we get into that and we also get into not 
the you want to you want to set rapists free and you want a woman to have an abortion or, or to you know have a rapist baby this is all sensational they don't work with these people we do so we we don't live in rhetoric we give real life specific examples that the listener the reader of the book can use that are that are credible um and i I'm, I'm glad we did that. It's not easy to write about some of this stuff and these stories that we have are, are horrible and tragic, but they're real and they happened. And we need to, you know, we need to, we need to, to highlight that. We did. And a lot of those sad stories, tragic stories have happy endings. The abortion industry has really been masterful in constructing narrative where the, you'll remember, uh, the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, and within a week we had the nine-year-old pregnant rape victim from Ohio who now had to travel out of state to get her abortion. You rotten pro-lifers are responsible for her having to travel. They were more concerned about this girl having to travel for the abortion than the fact that she was a nine-year-old girl who was impregnated by a, a sex criminal. And so I think what we do in What to Say When is we go after some of these hard issues where it would seem to be the home turf of the abortion supporters. They're very confident talking about rape, very confident talking about incest. And we can turn that on its head because yeah. who thinks that the abortion healed that nine-year-old girl of that trauma? I don't think so. And in fact, some of these specific stories that we're talking about are stories of women who chose life and triumphed over it. And we talk about the cases in which, um, you know, one of, I think so, in, in one of the chapters, we basically say, you want to talk about incest? Let's talk about Let's incest. Let's talk about incest. It's hard to talk about. I don't want to talk about it. You right. don't want to talk about it. Nobody wants to talk about it. But if they're going to talk about it, we will go there and we will talk about, okay, what about, what about our friend Christy, who was conceived in incest? And the tool of abortion was a mechanism for this man's father to continue abusing his daughter for decades. Where's the compassion in that? I don't think abortion is a compassionate option when it perpetuates abuse for two straight decades. And so this is where we take the fight to them. This is the strength, though, in post row. And, and it's, it's why people liked the first book. It's not because we wrote a great book. It's because the approach is... When you're in these conversations, you gently, lovingly show we're the compassionate ones here. You're not. And, and you can lead people to that because that's the thing. They care about people and we don't. That's the, that's the argument. And, and that's, a, that's a, a timeless thing, I think, with, with liberal versus conservative. Um, but that's just not true. When it comes to abortion, and it's certainly not true in in post row, um, and I think we need to own that. Like we should be proud of our a healthy pride, of our <laughs> of our of our charity. Like these pregnancy resource centers, this is awesome. Yeah, there's there's so many more resources that are actually trying to help women and families who have gone through this. But another thing that is a common narrative that we hear a lot. Um, from the pro-abortion side is very much if you were raped, you wouldn't be advocating for the overturning of yes. Roe versus Wade. If you this, that, and the other, if your daughter was this, that, and the other. And it's like, it's amazing to me that they think that this entire movement, very largely made up of a lot of women, <laughs> like that we haven't experienced these tragedies, we haven't experienced abortion Many of the women in our movement have had an abortion. Many of the men have coerced or encouraged their girlfriend to have an abortion or have lost a child to an abortion and it wasn't their choice and they didn't want the abortion. There's a lot of broken people that make up our movement who are coming from a place of healing mm -hmm. that are trying to help other people and if they can, help them prevent them from going through these tragedies. So it always makes me, I, I saw a post the other day and, and something I think you guys saw too that went viral um, where this man's wife had um, just had a miscarriage. And it was really tragic because um, the hospital system, according to, according to what they said, treated her really horribly. Um, but it's our fault. And if you'd had a miscarriage, then you wouldn't be supporting the... And I'm like, you think nobody that's pro-life has had a miscarriage? Really? You don't think that that hasn't happened to a bunch of women? Like, yeah. no, we know that. And if nothing else, that makes us more pro-life because we value life. We see the inherent and more dignity. more compassionate toward more those compassionate. who experience it themselves. Yeah, yeah, for sure. One, 
one thing that's happened since Roe is one side quit taking abortion so seriously, and that's that's the pro-abortion side. And they don't take rape seriously. Mm. I would make that claim. I, I can't count. I'm, I've had countless people tell me that they hope one of my daughters gets raped. Yeah. Ugh. That's not a that's not a comment that that people make. Like I, I who would wish that on anyone? That's somebody who doesn't take the subject matter seriously. They're sensationalizing it. It's like saying if you don't let me do something I'll kill myself. Mm. I mean, there there's a rape is serious, which is one of the lines out of the new book. And they don't they don't take it seriously. And they certainly don't take abortion seriously because they see it as like a solution to the world's problems or something frivolous. And no woman has ever gone in for an abortion, come out and done an interview saying well, that wasn't a big deal. Nobody says that. That wasn't a tough decision, all right? You know, that forget having regret or whatever or finding God. You know, they think that well, they just got religion. That's why they regret their abortion. No, they don't. They regret it because they regret it. And I think that the, the, the seriousness of it is, as they sensationalize everything post-Roe, make all these unwanted children going to go live with Kavanaugh because he did this. All this <laughs> garbage that we have to listen to, there needs to be like a little bit of a sober up here. Like we're talking about something that's serious and we get into that with the rape and we get into that with the incest. We get into that with whether you care about born children. We get into that with the Supreme Court. We get into that with the trans movement. A lot of pro-lifers don't want to deal with trans. They don't want to deal with homosexuals. They think it's separate issues. It has invaded the the abortion issue. The men claiming they have abortions, we break that down. <laughs> the The dude that wants to get the uterus implanted so he can grow a baby and abort it and all of that we break all that down not in like a it's a very inspiring uplifting book i have to say <laughs> and the ending's beautiful i love it and so but like it's like you still should order the book but um we have to highlight this stuff and we we can't hide from it and i i do think there's a lot of hiding and there's a lot of deer in the headlights and there is no topic related to abortion that a pro lifer can't go into and do so confidently and lovingly and charitably knowing in the back of our minds it is so important because the life of a baby is at stake when we discuss this stuff yeah, and I want to be clear, it's not a sensational book. You no. know, we talk about the hot sauce and all of these like extreme cases of the uterine implant and that sort of thing. It's not a sensational book. It's not a like, hey, we scoured the worst of the bowels of the internet no. and here, here, here it is. But what it is is a lot of these particularly hard cases like rape or incest, there there are things that we can say and that we should say that are accurate. Like, well, okay, you know, it's awful that a woman was raped. We don't defend that at all. We want the criminal to be in jail. Those are the right things to say. Um, and the baby shouldn't pay the price for the crimes of the father, and that is true as well, and we should say that as well. But if we stop there, sometimes you end up with this scenario where you've got people, the moderates, you might say, kind of weighing, like, okay, well, Bill Maher, pro-lifers like babies, I like women. And I think what this book does is I think it empowers pro-lifers to say, you don't have to pit a mother against her child. Yes. Abortion is going to harm them both, and life is going to be good for them both. And that is, I think, that additional step that we needed to take if we're going to win those hearts and minds. Uh, I'll say on the soft and fluffy note, I think that what to say when to is funnier. I think we sprinkle stuff. Obviously, these topics we're discussing aren't funny, but there's... We understand, like we do on the podcast, that there there's some very heavy, heavy. These are all heavy topics, um, but we we can use humor and and in our conversations and need to. It humanizes us and helps us humanize the unborn. But I, I think in what to say when too, uh, not in places where it would be inappropriate. But there are. We keep you going so that you're not sitting here getting, you know, it's not a beat down. It's a, it's a very joyful book. It's a practical book. And there are parts that are funny. <laughs> and so much funnier than the first one because some of this is funny. 
Some of it's serious. Some of it's tragic. Some of it's funny. And uh, we have to acknowledge that. I wouldn't expect any less. <laughs> That's right. There's a couple of references to food. Mm. Oh, all right. Maybe movies. I don't know. <laughs> see. But, all movies Steve has seen, I'm sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's, uh, let's cover some of the basics, which is um, Roe was overturned. I don't think people think about this whenever they're getting into a conversation. But there was a group of people who were ready. There's a group of people who were kind of surprised and there's a group of people that were not ready and shocked and are still in disbelief. Yeah, who was ready? The grassroots. All of you were ready for Roe to be overturned. I remember Sean and Heather, the night before the Supreme Court heard the case, I know Dr. Haywood flew out and was leading a vigil in front of the Supreme Court. I went down and I helped lead a vigil in front of the last abortion facility in Mississippi, Jackson Women's Health Organization of Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. And we had the big rally, and everyone's excited, enthusiastic, a little bit nervous, unsure. Like, what are they? Like, just electricity was in the air. And the media was out in full force. And I did an, a media interview with NBC News, a reporter, and she said, Oh, well, if, if the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade and abortion is illegal, what are you guys going to start doing to help all these women who need abortions? Mm. And I said, Well, we're not going to start doing anything. We're going to continue to do what we've been doing for the last 50 years, which is establishing pregnancy help centers and throwing baby showers for these moms and providing medical care and professional services and career coaching and housing and all of the things that they need. That's already in place. And the reporter just kind of like blank look in the eyes. But if it's overturned, like what are you going to do to help these women? Oh so I was like, okay, we'll go into a little bit more depth here for those in the back who can't hear. <laughs> and I kinda, Nothing. I could care less. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what you want? <laughs> Laid it all out, all the different resources that are available and have been available and outnumber abortion facilities four to one. And she, she said a third time, and I, I, at this point I'm finding like, I feel like maybe Peter did in the scriptures, like, disturbed that Jesus asked him a third time. Yes. <laughs> Peter, son of Jonah, or Simon. <laughs> Do you, you love yeah. <laughs> So I was just like, look, we can, you can ask the same question all night long, and I'm going to give you the same answer. We don't need to start doing anything. We're going to continue to do it. We're going to continue to professionalize it. We're going to continue to advance it. Everything that a woman needs is in place for her to choose life, and we're going to continue to provide it without demanding that the government do it. If they want to help, great. I'm glad for that, but we, we don't wait for the stimulus check to come in before you put a shovel in the ground and build a pregnancy help center or a maternity home. These things are done on the backs and through the generosity of local pro-lifers. And so that is my long, meandering way of saying the grassroots was ready. They didn't need to start doing any, anything. We're continuing to take it to the next level is what we're doing. Was that the media segment the next day? It was just you saying, we don't need to start doing anything. <laughs> and next, next, who's the next oh, one? Oh, they, 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 they <laughs> definitely edited it. Steve looks like the, the bigot that he is. They were waiting um, for, they wanted the old, angry, white man going, we don't need to do nothing. She got herself into this. Or she can get herself out of it. Like, I got one thing to say. Go <laughs> Packers. Yeah. That's where sometimes you recognize you've done a good job. On, if you've got an axe grinder as a reporter and they end up not using your clip, like, it's always That's disappointing. It's always a compliment. Sometimes you know you said something they didn't want to put in. Print. Yep. Yep. They, they yeah. try to entrap you and make you say stupid things and they don't. Yeah. I always take that as a compliment. Every interview that I did in Austin <laughs> It's like, oh, they didn't air my segment again? Sweet. <laughs> I've, I've probably been interviewed by PBS 10 times. It never airs. Oh, my NPR, gosh. NPR, eight or nine, never airs. And so it's kind of a waste of time. And um, But I still do it. So. And sometimes that's because of what we say that's good. And sometimes I've been part of it where the I'm able to see what the abortion supporter is saying or the, the abortion industry rep. And it's so bad that you can kind of see the cringe in the reporter. Like, we'll just toss that footage out. It's not going to make the 10 o'clock news. Mm. My favorite was NBC. And, and at the time, I, we had a feeling um, that the reporter was at least independent, maybe not pro-life. And I'm going through the interview, and she's challenging me. And it was on Alabama's abortion ban. And um, so we're going through the whole thing. And, and Cuomo had done the stuff in New York. So I was like... Why, why can't Alabama do this? So if Cuomo can abort babies when they're born and do infanticide and, and light up the Empire State Building, why can't Alabama say, you're insane. We're not doing that. We believe in science and we're going to protect babies. This is 2019 before science became a controversial word because of Fauci. And so we believe in science. <laughs> 
I know you like that. First reference. one. <laughs> and we're going to protect babies from conception. So all this. And then uh, she asked me about rape. And I went through it. And then she asked me about something else. And then we, we, we ended the interview. And she said, your rape point was really, really good. I've never heard that like that and I was like which was obviously like a confidence booster because I was like are they gonna somehow manipulate my comments and shred me on rape but she was like and they aired it and and then bless her heart they interviewed one of the few remaining uh, abortion facility uh, directors this lady should not you know Planned Parenthood usually puts pretty decent people on camera at the national level um Cecil Richards was great in the media this is not the situation in this <laughs> And this was a national news story. It was NBC. And it's brutal. And this woman w was in her office. I'm not going to like degrade how she looked or whatever. But she said, I just don't know where these black women are going to go and get their abortions. And mine as well had the Marlboro sticking out of her like mouth with like the like. with like the natty light, you know, which I got no problem it's with. It's kinda natty like light. bouncing in the lips yeah. as she talks, the ashes flying up. I got there. no problem with that. I'm from East Texas. Marlboro's a natty light, which is part of our life, right? <laughs> and so it's not that, but I'm like, not a good look. It's the only time. And she aired it. And I was like, this is this is like really bad. Like you can't say everything that you said. But they aired it, and that's the only time. I was shocked because I didn't know what the other, they were like, and we have interviewed an abortion uh, supporter or worker and all that. And so I'm like, oh, well, they'll just manipulate what I, what I say. And they didn't. And uh, I went back because I recorded it. Um, and the reporter, you could barely see it. I had to like zoom in, had a miraculous medal, like ah. a Mary on it. I was like, hey. We had an ally, and I didn't know it because she was hammering me as she should. That's what reporters should do. That's why I love doing the the BBC because they just blast you with their great accents, <laughs> and they sound nice, but they're just like these ruthless people. But it's a fun interview. It's not boring, you know. And so um, I got a kick out of that. But most of them, they're not going to do that. They're not going to do that at all. And I'm telling you, all of these arguments and these points, when said with charity – they're the screamers, we're not. Mm -hmm. They're the know-it-alls, we're not. And and they've never heard this before. They've never heard this before. Borderline unprofessional for the reporter to say, that was a really good argument. I've never heard that before. Yeah. But it was like a natural reaction. And so I just, I think people, I want people to be not just confident, but, you know, we're not on a, you know, when this comes up, I just hope I know kind of what to say. I know that's part of it, but it's more, it's bigger than that. This is mission driven, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like we just, we don't need like just purpose in life. We're, we're on a mission if we're Christian and we've been commissioned and we have to defend life and we have to do it charitably and lovingly. And we know people convert. Yes. Workers convert. They... Uh, reporters, women who have had an abortion, women considering abortion, that, that just happens. And, and one of the things I think that is helpful, and I'm glad we did it this way, but this book has more specific examples that happened in real life after we make a point that, that there's, there's more stories and it just helps uh, because you can use those. And if somebody's like, well, you made that up, you can reference the book. Yeah, so grassroots prepared and we're... I'm going to see more prepared uh, through this tool that we've released. And certainly the grassroots preparation continues into the fact that before leading up to Roe being overturned and since Roe was overturned, we continue to see record-sized 40 Days for Life campaigns. People are going out and they're praying and they're doing the community outreach and they're standing vigil in front of these facilities. And that has an impact regardless of what the state-level politicians who are celebrating infanticide do or the good pro-life politicians who are protecting unborn children, our prayers continue to make that difference. I think similar to after uh, the release of Unplanned, this was another big, you know, the overturning of Roe versus Wade was another big thing that was in the news a lot. And it caused people who self-described as lax pro-lifers to be like, okay, 
I actually need to do something. And so I think some of those people started a 40 Days for Life campaign where there was none. I think some of those people started um, getting together with their church and area-wide churches to say, we don't have a pregnancy center within 60 miles, and we need to have one. We don't want women from our community driving you know, 60 miles or whatever to the next abortion facility and or maybe it's even closer. So I think a, a lot of people were compelled and convicted to step up and actually take action. I know that churches on the local level, there were a lot of churches that were like, oh, we don't really like have a pro-life move like a, a ministry here. We Maybe we should do something. Maybe we should start having diaper drives. Maybe we should pay more attention to the pregnancy center that's in our community. Mm-hmm. So I think that's um, positive, and I hope that that doesn't, you know, die down. I hope that that continues because uh, people are seeing more and more with this being in the news, the need to serve women and men and also to um, see that people need healing. So... Well, we saw it. We added cities. We lost cities when Roe fell because we of did, the yeah. best reason. Yeah. Their abortion clinic closed and there's no more 40 days for life. 74 cities now across the country no longer have abortion facilities, but they did before they did 40 days for life. And right. maybe that number will be outdated by the time this airs. You never know. <laughs> abortion free. Hard to get an abortion free city. This is obviously an example, but an abortion free city is when there's one abortion facility, it closes, and then obviously. There's not another one, so you're truly abortion-free. So that's the 74 number, which in our strategic plan, our five-year goal was 75. So we're on the cusp of that. Right on the brink, baby. A year early. Tell us if your abortion, if your city becomes abortion-free, we need to hit our goal. Um, okay, who was not ready? And I think this was kind of predictable. Once the maybe it was a, it was definitely a grace that the leak happened in May of 2022 because it sort of watered down, I think, the reaction. It just all didn't happen in 24 hours. Um, I guess I wasn't surprised at the violence, uh, the, the attacks on the pregnancy centers. Who was the ridiculous lady who was out at the Supreme Court with the bullhorn saying, we're gonna like bring it on, we're gonna fight you in the street or something? I forget what it was. It was... There's a lot of shenanigans. I know, I know. You have to yeah. narrow it down, the psychos with bullhorns. I didn't no, want to say. What more like a lot of names running. Yeah. running uh, Maxine I don't, Waters. I think it was uh, Maxine Waters. Okay. She was my favorite. Because <laughs> okay. she just came unhinged. And and <laughs> I understand why she did. We, we, we wrote the book knowing where the other side is. I understand. They, they did not think this was going to happen. Abortion became a lazy issue for them because Roe gave them a lot of comfort. And it had come up in a presidential debate, and that was it. But it was it was cozy, and it was comfortable. Even with Trump's appointments, they just didn't think the Supreme Court was actually going to overturn it. So I understand the, like, nutso reaction. Um, but many, uh, abort, uh, many Democrats were not prepared know if they didn't think that though because you had the whole Kavanaugh hearing which everybody knew was actually about abortion and no it was about his with... fake rape thing or whatever he made out with the girl with but the why go so hard against him it was because they knew he was another pro-life supposedly another pro-life voice to be added on to the Supreme Court and they knew that if if Trump was successful in getting more justices appointed, then this actually meant there was a real possibility of Roe being overturned. They did, but the reason for that, so Gorsuch was a shoe in because that was the first one, right? Mm-hmm. But Trump was saving Amy Coney Barrett because he knew there was no way they wouldn't confirm her. So he saved her. And right. They knew that. They knew that she was the number one draft pick that he was just like saving in case he got a third. So Kavanaugh was the guy they had to just kill. Hmm. He he was the the low hanging fruit. It wasn't Gorsuch yeah. because that was just sitting there right right when he I'd added he had no issue, um, and so Kavanaugh was like the, but for the pro lifers, Kavanaugh was the one we mistrusted the most, and he ended up being one of the strongest ones in the overturning of Roe, which is phenomenal when you read his comments. But um, that's that's I I. I don't know to answer your question, but they didn't expect it. I think they still thought 
They There's still precedent. were, yeah. They and still the were the angry. attorneys, the pro-abortion attorneys, like they would ask. I think Alito asked, "Where in the Constitution is this, um, or where is the precedent?" Like before Roe v. Wade, or it was some like basic legal question that you would ask. And there's one point where the, because he's like, give me an example of where this has been common law. That was it. Abortion's common law. Everybody knows. It's like, you can't, you know, yell fire. And you just say it and, it, and, as it, just, and then it becomes true. Or something. Yeah, everybody knows you can't steal somebody else's wallet. That's common law, right? You don't need a Supreme Court case to say stealing is wrong. So they're saying abortion, legalized abortion is common law. I'm going to use that defense for anything from now on. <laughs> Absolutely. How come you can just eat fried cheese curds at 6 o'clock in the law. morning? Mm, common law. Common law. <laughs> uh, it's Wisconsin. Common yeah. law. That so, may actually be true. So this is like a, when we you know we get into all this. But the, the, the common law thing is... It shows the legal desperation and the weakness of Roe. So Alito asks, well, give me an example of how this was cited as common law and a reference in, in our history of our country that abortion was common law. And the attorney l looks at him and says, you can't get rid of a 50-year precedent. Hmm. <laughs> wow. Like, I don't have a reference but what the heck are we doing here? We need abortion. That was basically their argument. <laughs> that was that was Kavanaugh. That was when Kavanaugh wrote, uh, if we didn't overturn precedent, we'd still have slaves. Yeah. Like that's what we do here. We make mistakes, we correct them, but we precedent is not, it's not the Ten Commandments. Otherwise we'd still have slaves. Women wouldn't be allowed to vote. Like it, he went on the list. And that that was kind of the end. It, for those in the courtroom, from what I heard, like that was like, okay, they're they're just now grasping for straws, yeah, and then looking at the justices going, please don't overturn it. They're toast. Yeah, <laughs> but there'd been such a. I think we even as pro lifers, I don't know. I think you expected it, Sean. I am some sometimes a pessimist by nature, as you know. <laughs> Steve thinks the world's going to end tomorrow, and I'm like, hey, <laughs> Rose's going to be overturned. It's going to be great. No, it's not. No, it won't. <laughs> But there's this element, I think most pro-lifers were probably in my camp, which is the wrong camp. But we've seen sort of like Lucy yank the football away from Charlie Brown so many times. And we think about some of the shenanigans that we've seen from John Roberts. And, um, you know, he, they were going to overturn Obamacare. And then they, then John Roberts saved it at the last moment. And sometimes you get these cases that seem like they're, they're open and shut cases. And the ruling comes out and it's like a four to three to two ruling. You're like, so what does that mean? Four is a minority, but they had the most votes. Like all these things are kind of confusing and they don't always end up as clear cut as we expect. So I just kind of thought they're going to find a way to, you know, punt the question again. And, and all of that is just my background for why I think there was such a surprise and shock when it happened. It just seemed like all these different cases, Casey back in the nineties and, you know, partial birth abortion bans being back and forth. I just thought, okay, this is, it's not going to be a, a cut and dried case. And it could not have been more cut and, and dried. It could not have been more black and white. As you say, Sean, they didn't just overturn Roe v. Wade. They beat it up with a baseball bat. And that's why I don't think the abortion supporters saw it coming. And their response, again, was violence. They torched pregnancy centers. They said, what are you going to do to start helping women? And then, then we told them and they torched those buildings. And uh, what are you going to do if uh, all these different cases and, and they didn't know what to do. So it was, was kind of like when you're talking to like your three-year-old and your two-year-old and, and they're like hitting each other with a toy hammer, like, use your words, use your words. <laughs> they didn't use their words. They didn't have any words. Yes. Oh, well, they had words. They were just ugly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's a hundred percent true. We do cover, as you know, in the book, the counter argument to that which is the common sense one, which is, well, ultimately the Supreme Court did compromise somewhat because they sent it back to the states and they didn't do that with slavery and say, you know, that was the problem is it was a state's rights issue. And you're like, but we don't, we don't really get to decide like what states black people are protected under the law. And, and, and the same with the unborn, but they did not I don't think anybody expected this. This would have been awesome. This would have been truly the answer to the ultimate prayer, which is they recognize unborn children under the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't need a constitutional amendment to end abortion. It's in there. 
And under the 14th Amendment, the unborn should be recognized according to biology and common sense. Justice Thomas was the only one that wanted to do that. Yeah. The others wanted to, but I, there was comments about, I, we just, nobody's going to go for that. That would like, cause. Too much too fast. Too much too fast, which just shows, you know, ultimately there's not true independence of the law when, when mm-hmm. things, you know, come under fire. But um, but that that I think is a healthy criticism of what the Supreme Court did um, is that they didn't go all the way. There was no chance they were going to go all the way. I, I know that's politically an unrealistic expectation, but according to common sense and the right thing to do, it's exactly what they should have done. Um, but they didn't. So it did go back to the states and it caused the the world that we're in now. Um, the media was not prepared. And I say that surprised because the media typically, conservative, liberal, progressive, whatever you want to say, they're always wanting and promoting bad news when there's not any, actually. And this was even with the leak. They you know, I know Roberts was running around the Supreme Court building telling him, we can't do this, and that didn't work, thank God. But they, they freaked out. Absolutely freaked out and crucified uh, Ginsburg. Wasn't that fun to see? The notorious RBG, their <laughs> hero. Like, and and I, she's dead. Yeah. Like, God rest your soul. And they're, <laughs> they're attacking her because she didn't resign. And I think they've backed off of that a little bit since then. I think they've gone back to the sort of like cult worship of, of, of her. But at the time, you know, she wanted to be sworn in by President Hillary Clinton, the first female president swearing in one of the first female Supreme Court ju- or the first Supreme one of the first Supreme Court justices swearing in the first female president and uh, and obviously that backfired spectacularly because uh, sh- she uh, was replaced by Trump then and it backfired bigly big, bigly <laughs> gosh God rest and, your soul yeah it was it was um, it was just a wild thing to see them go after kind of two long-time liberal icons. This wasn't like kind of like the, the weird activist class. This was mainstream media. And also she criticized Roe. She mm-hmm. agreed with it, but she was wrongly decided. And so... Um, Bad Sandra, law. Sandra Day O'Connor, same thing. Rose on a collision course with itself. And, um, you know, I, I think I, they definitely weren't prepared. Republicans weren't prepared immediately. We, we like win the Super Bowl and we're like, well, we're really sorry about all that. Let's uh, take away some of our wins. We'll do 15 weeks. Yeah. We'll do a 15 week ban just to show how reasonable we are. And you're like, but, but Alabama, Texas, they're like banning abortion. So now the standard is 15 weeks. Those places truly are yeah. tyrannical. And credit where it's due, some of the politicians at the state level were ready. They had trigger laws or they acted very quickly after it was overturned. Some of those folks are now getting cold feet. I mean, we saw Republicans join Democrats in Arizona to get rid of their pro-life law in that state. Devastating and just, I don't know, that's that's not going to age well. Won't age well. Yeah, but... Uh, but in general, particularly at the national level, yeah, this 15-week nonsense, uh, it's still more liberal than most of Europe. And they're just afraid to discuss it. They don't know how to discuss it. These, the politicians maybe need to get a copy of what to say when to. I Yes, they do. <laughs> they, they absolutely do. I, this makes me think back to probably about a year after I was more much more involved in the pro life movement and kind of doing this full time and devoting you know my life to it a good friend of mine good friend of ours here in Texas um asked the question thinking ahead of when row not if but when row is overturned how should we punish women and for me i was like whoa, like I've never thought about that before. And it was a legitimate question. And so from then on, like I thought, you know, thought through that, talked to a lot of people who had been in the movement for a long time, talked to former abortion workers after that, and kind of had a better understanding and, and you know, things uh, to look forward to and how we should handle that. But that's, it was as if that was never asked by politicians who have been politicians for decades. Mm -hmm. Like they never asked themselves that and they never... Going back to that other thing, it's like they didn't expect that it would happen either. Like, yeah, we're fighting for it, and we're glad you voted for us so that we can fight for this, but 
They never ask themselves that question. And that's that was amazing to me. It's like, so now, oh, ooh, we got to apologize for this. This is too much. And to make sure we're not taken out of context here, we are not advocating in the book or anywhere else. Locking for... up women. <laughs> Haley, no, no, Haley, no, yeah. uh, Nikki Haley said that we wanted the death penalty for women who had an abortion. And I don't know where she got that, but she's... No. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, we don't agree with that. And I think more of a broader question, what should the punishment be altogether? You know, like What's who? weird about the lawmakers is they're uncomfortable with that question and they're lawmakers. So the easiest thing, I've been asked that a million times, you want to lock women up? And you're like, but that, when something happens, and we saw it with gay marriage, there's new law and state laws adjust accordingly over time we saw it with gay marriage you see it with drugs that it's different in every jurisdiction and over time you know let's say colorado bans marijuana and they're like man we had it made for a couple of years this is the colorado drug guy voice mm. and uh and so i've been working on it and so you know he's like man this sucks you know i was getting high every night now i can't go broncos and he can't so he still has weed and so the laws evolve with, well, it was legal, and then, of course, he still had some weed, and, and all of that. That's local jurisdiction. What they want us to say is, well, the woman's a murderer and should go on death row. They're wanting us to say that. Yeah, yeah, of course what, they want us to say that. What's weird is the answer is not complicated. If you it, Forget abortion. You don't have to address the woman having an abortion. That needs to be irrelevant. It's when there's law, and that those laws are broken— we have a judicial system that handles that from yeah. the local level, the state level, and the federal level. It becomes like a civics course, and that's how America works. We can disagree with the law for sure. We can agree with the law, but we have a justice system, and I don't understand why that got all mixed up with like, I don't know what to say. They're asking me if a woman should go to prison. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? And it's another case where they're bringing up everything other than abortion. Suddenly we're not talking about, is it okay to dismember a child? Now we're talking about the nuances of how do you apply the penal code? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, and, you know, we cover, I like asking questions in that scenario. If an abortion doctor does an illegal abortion, should he go to jail? Should he be charged? If an orthopedic surgeon does hip replacement surgery on your grandma on his kitchen island. Eesh. Is that frowned upon? Yeah. Yeah. Should I not have done that? Can you should he be punished? Like if abortion is health care, we need to go into the different aspects of, you know, if if California outlaws heart surgery and a heart surgeon does <laughs> cardiovascular surgery on your grandpa. Should he go to prison? No, because he saved his life. But abortion doesn't save your life. Right. So it, you know, anyways, there's ways to get into it. But the, the, I think the Republicans were watching the news that day. They're, you know, or maybe, I don't know. Let's say they were on the golf course. We'll do like, they're the wealthy country club white Republicans, the evil people. Lighting cigars with $100 bills. Totally. And like talking about the good old days when women stayed at home and didn't talk or vote. So these evil Republicans, they're on the golf course. And we couldn't wear pants. Couldn't wear pants. And somebody <laughs> runs out and says, Dad, Grandpa, they overturned Roe versus Wade. And I think the Republican like took the cigar out of his mouth and was like, great. Because <laughs> it's votes that were easy. It's talking points that were easy and because the Republicans were sitting there saying, I think Roe should be overturned, never believing for a moment that day would ever come. Yeah. A lot of the most courageous and heroic and strong pro-life legislation is passed by legislatures who know they have a governor that will veto it immediately. Totally. And I think the same principle applies here with the Supreme Court. Oh, we'll pass it. Supreme Court will just prevent it from being blocked anyway. We get credit for it from the pro-lifers. We don't get blamed because it doesn't take effect. Well, now it's in effect. I think one thing for people to remember, um, and it's, it's, I'd say the most important thing, 
is that we have been here before and mm-hmm. we need to calm down and reconstruct the ending of slavery. The emancipation was awesome. It was one of the greatest moments in the history of our country. It was a disaster afterwards. Reconstruction was brutal. Right. Europe was looking at us going, this is, this is the end of America for sure. And most of us probably would have believed that, you know, if we were living in that time. Um, we always talk about the whole darn country has gone down the toilet. I mean, it actually was going down the toilet geographically, physically, spiritually, every aspect of our country, economically. It, it just looked dire, and it was hard, and Reconstruction was brutal. And you had reasonable, well-respected people saying, we need to go – we need to walk this back. We need to have proposals, you know. We need to maybe you could be a slave from eighteen to thirty-four, or maybe like there there needs to be a reasonable. This is too much too soon, and and we don't even think about that now. Those people are frowned upon in history, just like these Republicans in Arizona will be who voted for abortion. But I think the chaos the chaos doesn't deserve to win the day. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's so short term. It's so it's it's tempting, I think, particularly in the 24 hour news cycle, you just look at like, okay, we're here in this moment of time. And yes, things are chaotic. But if you take a longer view, this was never going to be easy. We've said from the beginning that it wasn't going to be easy. I don't know why we would expect it to be easy. I've got kind of this bizarre theory that in the age of television and movies, everything's resolved in 30 minutes or it's resolved in like two hours. And people just kind of think, all right, happily ever after. But all great victories for human rights, all great victories for civil rights require a price to be paid. And that price is vigilance, it's fortitude, it's endurance. And now is the time that we pay that price by sticking with it. Even even when some politicians we thought were our friends turn their backs on us, even when we're insulted by the media or abortion supporters, we bear it and we keep the flame alive. And uh, if you take the long view of history, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said the the arc of the moral universe is long, but it always bends toward truth. Mm. And it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And most people don't defend the unborn because it's the right thing to do. They defend it because it's it's their position or they're part of a political affiliation. uh, But they they always end up compromising to some level. And we can't do that. All of those major changes. I mean, the abolitionists, they lost a lot of credibility. They had issues with violence. Their movement took a lot of hits, but they just kept going because it was the right thing to do. Same with MLK. It's just the right thing to do. I don't care if the country's ready for it. This is an abomination, what we're doing. And it's it's the same, um, it's the same for us. So... Um, any closing comments that you have, Steve? I think it's important to use this book in real conversation when it comes out in September. Uh, I know everybody's always on social media, making their points on social media and, and owning people on social media. And I'm not saying don't share what you learn from this book on social media. I certainly can. But uh, as President Reagan said, and I like to quote him often, all meaningful change in America begins at the dinner table, and we've got to get with our friends. And this is when it comes up at Thanksgiving. We're not going to be like the obnoxious people who are like, hey, I know we're at a baseball game, but did you know? Um, but this, these things come up, and we've got opportunities to have meaningful conversations with the people in our life. If we know where they stand on abortion, we can challenge them a little bit. If we don't know, we can ask them to think about it a little bit. And I think this book really equips people to ask questions. Because at the end of the day, everybody is talking. Everybody's shouting. Nobody wants to hear what you have to say. They want you to hear what they have to say. So give them the chance to say what they have to say. Ask the hard questions. Why did the Supreme Court overturn Roe v. Wade? What was inaccurate about the rule? If you're pro-abortion, what was inaccurate about the ruling in the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe? Um, you know, what was Dred Scott binding president? What is abortion? What is human life? Where does the value of human life come from? How do we know that human life has value at all? These are questions that just get people thinking. And I think the book kind of like will seed your imagination with ways to, to launch into those discussions. Does it matter if I care about born children? Yeah. Let's say I don't. I don't like born children. I don't like my own kids. I hate them all. Yeah. Is abortion okay? So we have, that's one of the funny chapters, actually. We go into that in depth, so people will hopefully enjoy that. Um, you said something, and what's, ha- what's happening, and the reason we, you know, we were like, I think we need to write this book, is 
the conversations are happening. You're just either prepared or not. Yeah. You don't get out of it. It's not like you're you're reading this so that you can like go out and and you know go on offense. You'll be able to do that if you want to at your kid's baseball game, but it's going to happen. It's happening. The conversations are happening. It's definitely going to happen this fall because the Democrats are putting everything in the abortion you know uh, uh, basket for for winning the election. And so uh, one of the reasons we're releasing it on September the tenth. So. Uh, be sure to order your copy. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. You can also order it directly uh, from 40 Days for Life. We make more money if you order it directly from us. It helps support our mission, so we'll be out with that. You also get free shipping if you uh, order directly uh, from us. We know Amazon does free shipping because of Prime, but we're trying to compete with them. But you will not get a signed copy on Amazon. You can only get that through 40 Days for Life. It's a pretty impressive bulk order discounts as well. Yeah, we have a lot of bulk order discounts. You see them uh, on the screen, and you can go uh, to 40daysforlife.com slash two. 40daysforlife.com slash two, the number two as in what to say when to. So you can go and get those special prices. Uh, Pre-order, you may get your book early as we get them in, so be sure to get that uh, uh, ordered directly from 40 Days for Life. And um, and we look forward to getting your feedback, and our prayer is that this helps you uh, defend those children who have absolutely no voice but yours. And so uh, let's, let's defend them uh, with love, with truth, um, and with mercy because that's what we need in our in our very hurting and wounded society is we need mercy in this book uh, our prayers that it's a great tool for you to uh to speak uh, about this issue and defend these children with uh, love in your heart so please rate review share this podcast and we will see you next time god bless you